many people think we have like an office and uh, staff and such things, but we don't. We don't have a, a fixed location. Uh, well, we wanted to like cover the news, uh, be a practical help for people that didn't know how to do it, because there was no there was no site in Sweden explaining how it's done. It was spread by on the street, like from person to person. How do you do this? So we we basically we copied. I copied uh, a lot of guides from a from a Swedish biggest internet magazine. Like wrote them off. That was the start. The Pirate Bay has never been a core activity of Pirate Bay. Uh, as soon as the Pirate Bay got an like an important tracker, it was like cut off from Pirate Bay, so that we could go on with our core activities. While the people who like to run a BitTorrent tracker do that on their own, because that's I mean our basic principle is not about building empires, but branching off and 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 uh, create a multiplicity of projects. Many international watchers are a bit astonished about how we, instead of uh, taking a very defensive approach, are taking the offensive I mean, without being aggressive in, in that way, but using the, the term pirate signals something that many people didn't think was possible at all. If you buy bootleg videos or download illegal copies from the internet, how are the people who bring you the movies supposed to pay for my glasses, get health insurance, and pay off my student loans. Because the movies we love are the work of hundreds of people. Not just the actors you see on screen. Or directors. But cameramen. Script supervisors. Fire safety officers. Costumers. And countless others. Yeah! With your support, we'll all keep on working. I don't think that's the whole truth, because I don't think they would earn much more money uh, without people downloading. Just, just trying to keep on making money by selling a small plastic disc with, uh, with information on them is, is obviously something that won't last. But they have to find new ways. So there were like hundreds of really creative people, and they, if they think like, they can find out new ways. It's not my job. It's not going to happen tomorrow, of course. So I really hope that just, and it will, the society and all the uh, the stuff around the, the music industry and the bands and everything, it will, will change, so you know, it will be different, I think. And I don't think there's going to be uh, you know, producers and PR people, and then the next day it's going to be everybody downloads, no one, gets, uh, no one gets paid, and all the musicians you know, will die and starve to death and so on. Uh, a lot of what the major media companies do today are so, so obviously based around the copyright, the copyright model. I mean, uh, in, in the US you speak about the temp temple model, you, fi find a, you find a space of intellectual property that's, that ha hasn't yet been claimed and you, you, put, you, you put your temp temple down and raise a whole tent around it. Like for example if you make a movie you also sell plastic toys and, and, and such which kind of make up, makes up the tent and, and obviously that, that sort of model is, uh, would be impossible with uh, with a different intellectual property climate. They have managed to adapt historically. When the first, first tape recorders came, oh no, people will be able to copyright music yeah. and, and such. So, uh, and when the, the first video recorders came, it was the same. Oh no, people, people will copy our, copy our property and we won't make any money, but obviously they, they were able to adapt to that also. It's analogous to the complaint that was made against uh, the video cassette recorder 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when the industry did exactly the same crybaby act and said, you know, people recording films off television is going to put us out of business. Well, it didn't. It actually created another revenue stream, and they were able to sell video cassettes at the same time as people taped off air. And in the end, they were, the studios were proved wrong in the courts, and the courts decided against them. But 30 years ago, the, co the courts were much more pro-consumer. Now they're much more pro-corporate. 
I think that uh, the music we see on uh, MTV and these music channels, that kind of music will disappear, more or less. And I don't care because I don't even like it. And we will have uh, music which is more for the listeners and not just for people to make money on it. You know, $25 million per album, it's, I think it's absurd. I don't want to, I don't want to give money to them. I think it's so wrong. It would just, it would be, it's against my moral and my ethics. I think that the law is going to be rewritten as the technology insists that it is. You know, it's not a question of right or wrong anymore. Um, people will do what they want to do in, in order to uh, get what they want. All the, you know, what's the line about every, behind every great fortune lies a great crime? So the guys who started this business all cheated somebody to get there, and so now they're being cheated, perhaps. Uh, file sharing is not a problem, it's an opportunity. There's a Chinese proverb saying that when the winds of change are blowing, some people are building shelters and others are building windmills. It's interesting in historical perspective that up to the 70s, recorded music was rather seen as a threat against musicians by, for example, musicians' unions and collecting societies. Instead, it was totally obvious to them that live performances was and remained the main revenue stream for musical performers. Then, after the cassette tape explosion, there was some kind of capitul capitulation to recorded music. And, it, and there was a golden age for uh, for recording industry with the CD. But if we look backwards today, that rather looks like a historical parenthesis. And I would say that live performances are again turning to, to be the, the main revenue stream for musicians, most musicians. It's one of the great ironies that our enemy in this is our consumer. And one of the rules that anybody in marketing knows is not make an enemy of your customer. Uh, we have no choice because, uh, frankly, when the music is being consumed for free, they're no longer customers that we can look after, um, nor customers that we want. It is ridiculous to believe that you can give product away for free and be more successful. I mean, it defies the laws of nature. Would, would a clothing store sell, give all their clothes for free? A car dealership give all their clothes, cars for free? Of course not. Now, it doesn't mean you don't do some promotions and you don't use advertising creatively, but nobody can make, a, a, if they don't make a profit in this world, they're out of business. That's just the laws of human nature. The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. Freeze it. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? They are guarding all the doors, they are holding all the keys, but they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be.